G'day. I'd like to let you know that Aussie Med Ed is sponsored by Tigo. For most doctors, indemnity insurance is one of their biggest costs of practice. While many doctors are still with the same insurer they joined in medical school, many have made the switch to Tigo and benefited from it. The team at Tigo have told me that those new to private practice could qualify for four years of discounted premiums. To find out more about Tigo, visit tigo.com.au. That's T-E-G-O dot com dot A-U. A hot topic in the media at the moment is the use of chat GPT and other artificial intelligence sources for answering exam questions and in use in school. But what actually is this chat GPT? It does it have a role in the medical scenario as well? And will it take our jobs? Well, today I thought I'd try an interesting experiment. What about if I interview chat GPT? Ask him or her what they can answer a bit about themselves and find out if they've got any use in medical scenario. Good day and welcome to Aussie Med Ed, the Australian medical education podcast. A program born during COVID times to emulate that general chit chat and banter around the hospital with the idea of educating the medical student and GP alike. I'm Gavin Nyman, an orthopaedic surgeon based in Adelaide, and it's my pleasure to bring Aussie Med Ed to you. And to find out more about this chat GPT, I thought I'd interview chat GPT and ask chat GPT some questions. Find out what who they are. Find out what they can answer. See if they can actually answer any medical questions and how they deal with some curly ones thrown their way. And really find out if they've got a role to play in medicine. Following the interview with ChatGPT, we'll get this analysed by Associate Professor Jo Thomas, who's going to give her thoughts and opinions about what ChatGPT has to offer at the moment and what the future holds. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast has been produced, the Ghana people and pay my respect to the elders, both past, present and emerging. Well, today I'm going to actually try and interview ChatGPT. I'm going to try and do this as live as possible by asking the questions in real time through the speech microphone, through the actual Mac computer, and get it to answer questions from text to speech. I'm going to use the ChatGPT forum and see how we get on. Some of these questions may need to be stopped and started just for the completeness, but I'll do my best to try and keep it rolling as best as possible. Now, before we get underway, I'd also like to put in a disclaimer. This is obviously an experiment just to assess what ChatGPT and other AI bots have got to offer to give us an idea of what the future holds. But really, at this stage, this is not to be used for both medical diagnosis or nor treatment. And certainly, you should always consult a medical professional. Welcome, ChatGPT. What do you prefer to be called? You can call me ChatGPT or simply GPT. I'm an AI language model created by OpenAI. And can you tell me a bit about yourself? I am an artificial intelligence language model created by OpenAI. I have been trained on a large corpus of text data and I can generate human-like responses to a wide range of questions and prompts. My training data includes diverse topics such as science, history, art, and current events, among others, allowing me to answer a wide range of questions and provide explanations, summaries, and opinions on various subjects. I'm here to help and assist with information and knowledge-based queries. Can you diagnose medical issues? As an AI language model, I do not have the ability to diagnose medical conditions. It is not safe or appropriate for me to provide medical advice or make a diagnosis. If you have a medical concern, it is best to consult with a qualified healthcare professional. They will be able to provide you with a proper diagnosis and treatment plan based on a full evaluation of your symptoms and medical history. AI language models like me are not a substitute for professional medical advice and care. Do you think that AI will be used to diagnose medical issues in the future, though? It is possible that AI models like me may play a role in diagnosing medical conditions in the future, but it will likely be in combination with other tools and techniques and under the guidance of qualified healthcare professionals. AI technology has the potential to improve the accuracy and efficiency of medical diagnosis, but it will also be important to ensure that it is used appropriately and ethically. Additionally, AI models are trained on existing data, so it is important to ensure that the training data is diverse and representative of the population to avoid biased results. It is important to note that AI should never be used as a sole means of diagnosing medical conditions and that the opinion of a qualified healthcare professional should always be sought. Well, for the audience, I might just ask ChatGPT if she can diagnose what's wrong with my elbow. I've actually been getting a bit of tennis elbow after playing a bit of golf, and let's see how far I can take this to see if she can pick up the diagnosis. ChatGPT, I've been playing a lot of golf recently and developed some pain on the outside of my elbow. It's worse when I straighten my arm out. What do you think could be going on? 
pain on the outside of the elbow, also known as lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow, is a common condition in golfers and other athletes who repeatedly perform certain movements that put stress on the elbow. If you are experiencing pain, it is important to seek the advice of a healthcare professional, such as a doctor or physical therapist, who can help diagnose the cause of your pain and provide you with appropriate treatment. Treatment options for tennis elbow may include rest and physical therapy, the use of a brace or strap to support the elbow, pain medications, and other modalities like ultrasound or laser therapy. In severe cases, surgery may be required. A healthcare professional can recommend the best course of action for your individual case based on a complete evaluation of your symptoms and medical history. It is also important to address any underlying factors that may be contributing to your pain, such as poor technique or equipment issues in golf, and to make any necessary changes to prevent further injury. Again, it is important to seek the advice of a healthcare professional to ensure an accurate diagnosis and appropriate treatment plan. But what will a physiotherapist do for me? A physical therapist physiotherapist can play an important role in helping you manage and recover from pain, such as pain in your elbow. A physiotherapist will first assess your condition and perform a comprehensive evaluation to understand the cause of your pain and determine the best course of treatment. Based on their evaluation, your physiotherapist may recommend a range of treatments including stretching and strengthening exercises, to improve the flexibility and strength of the muscles and tendons in the affected area, and to prevent future injuries. Manual therapy, techniques such as massage, joint mobilization, or soft tissue mobilization to help reduce pain and improve range of motion. Pain management techniques, such as heat or cold therapy, electrical stimulation, or dry needling, to help manage pain and improve healing. Modalities, such as ultrasound, laser therapy, or other techniques, to help promote healing and reduce pain. Education and advice, on techniques to manage pain, avoid further injury, and maintain an active lifestyle. Home exercise program, to continue the rehabilitation process at home and to help prevent future injury. The specific treatment plan will depend on the individual and the cause of the pain. The goal of physiotherapy is to help reduce pain improve mobility, and get you back to your normal activities as quickly and safely as possible. So will it get better in time? The prognosis for tennis elbow, or lateral epicondylitis, can vary depending on a number of factors, including the severity of the injury, the type of treatment received, and the individual's response to treatment. With appropriate care, most people can recover from tennis elbow and regain full function of their arm. However, the recovery process can take time and requires patience and commitment to a rehabilitation program. In many cases, recovery from tennis elbow can take several weeks or months, and in some cases, the pain may persist for a longer period of time. It is important to follow the advice of a healthcare professional, such as a doctor or physiotherapist, and to complete the recommended treatment program in order to promote healing and reduce the risk of further injury. In some cases, modifying activities or using assistive devices, such as a brace, may be necessary to protect the affected area and prevent further injury. If you are concerned about your progress or if your pain is not improving, it is important to speak with your healthcare professional to ensure that you receive the best possible care. Will I need to have an operation? Surgery is usually not required for the treatment of tennis elbow, also known as lateral epicondylitis. In most cases, conservative treatments, such as physical therapy, the use of a brace or strap, pain medications, and other modalities like ultrasound or laser therapy, are effective in managing the symptoms of tennis elbow. However, in some cases, surgery may be necessary if conservative treatments have not been effective or if the condition is causing significant pain and impairment. Your healthcare professional will be able to advise you on the best course of action based on a complete evaluation of your symptoms and medical history. It is important to remember that surgery should be considered a last resort after all other conservative treatments have failed. Before deciding on surgery, it is important to consider the risks and benefits and to discuss your options with your healthcare professional. You call it tennis elbow, but it started after I was playing golf. How is that so? Tennis elbow, also known as lateral epicondylitis, is a common overuse injury that is often associated with repetitive movements, such as those seen in tennis players. However, 
The injury can also occur in golfers and other individuals who engage in activities that involve repetitive arm movements, such as throwing or lifting. The condition is caused by inflammation or damage to the tendons that attach the forearm muscles to the bone on the outer side of the elbow. The repetitive movements in activities like tennis and golf can put a great deal of stress on these tendons and lead to pain and inflammation. In your case, it seems that your pain is a result of playing golf, rather than tennis, and is still referred to as tennis elbow. The name does not necessarily reflect the specific activity that caused the injury, but rather the location of the pain and the type of injury sustained. Okay, let's see if ChatGPT can start being a little bit more specific. Let's see how much I can stretch her. Is there a specialist in Adelaide? I am an AI language model and do not have the ability to recommend specific doctors or specialists in a particular area. However, you can find a specialist in Adelaide by searching online for orthopedic surgeons, sports medicine specialists, or physiotherapists who have experience treating tennis elbow. You may also consider asking for a referral from your primary care physician or contacting local hospitals or clinics to find a specialist in your area. When choosing a specialist, it is important to consider factors such as their experience, qualifications, and reputation, and to make sure that they are the right fit for your needs and preferences. Additionally, it is important to get a second opinion if you are considering a significant medical procedure, such as surgery. This will give you a better understanding of your condition and the different treatment options available to you, and can help you make an informed decision about your care. Okay, I'm going to go a bit off stream now and see if it would pick up another issue that could occur in someone else's case that might be worrying to them. The pain is getting me down, and I'm sleep not sleeping, worrying if I'm ever going to get better. I'm no longer hungry, and I'm not even catching up with my friends. It is completely understandable to feel overwhelmed and frustrated when dealing with chronic pain. Pain can significantly impact one's daily life and affect physical, emotional, and mental well-being. If you are having trouble managing your pain and it is affecting your daily life, it is important to speak with your healthcare provider. They can help you determine the underlying cause of your pain and develop a treatment plan that is right for you. In addition to medical treatment, there are other steps you can take to manage your pain and improve your quality of life. Some tips include, staying active, gentle exercise, such as stretching and light strengthening, can help reduce pain and improve flexibility. Getting enough sleep. Sleep is important for pain management and overall health. Eating a healthy diet, eating a balanced diet can help support healing and overall health. Seeking support, talking to a trusted friend or family member, or seeking support from a mental health professional, can be helpful in managing stress and emotional well-being. It is also important to be patient with the healing process and to remember that recovery can take time. Working with your healthcare provider and following their recommended treatment plan can help you manage your pain and improve your quality of life. But chat GPT, I really can't be bothered doing that. I can't even be bothered getting out of my bed. I don't know if it's worth going on. If you are feeling hopeless and overwhelmed, it is important to reach out for help. Chronic pain can be challenging to manage, and it is normal to feel discouraged at times. However, it is important to remember that help is available and that you do not have to go through this alone. You may consider reaching out to a mental health professional who can provide support and help you manage the emotional and psychological aspects of chronic pain. A mental health professional can help you develop coping strategies, address any underlying mental health issues, and provide you with the tools and resources you need to manage your pain. If you are feeling suicidal or in immediate danger, it is important to seek help right away. You can call a crisis helpline in your area or go to the nearest emergency room or hospital. Remember, you are not alone and there is always hope. With the right support and treatment, it is possible to manage chronic pain and improve your quality of life. I did what you suggested and saw a doctor. He gave me some tablets, but now I have some burning sensation in my tummy. If you are experiencing a burning sensation in your stomach after taking medication, it is important to speak with your healthcare provider as soon as possible. This could be a side effect of the medication and could be a sign of an adverse reaction. Your healthcare provider will be able to assess your symptoms and determine the cause of the burning sensation. They may recommend adjusting your medication, prescribing a different medication, or providing you with treatment to manage the symptoms. In the meantime, you can take steps to manage the burning sensation, such as drinking plenty of water avoiding foods and drinks that can irritate your stomach, such as spicy or acidic foods eating smaller. 
more frequent meals avoiding lying down immediately after eating taking antacids or other over the counter medications to relieve the burning sensation it is important to follow your healthcare provider's recommendations and to keep them informed of any changes in your symptoms they can help ensure that you receive the appropriate care and treatment for your condition now i'd say that chat gpt didn't really phrase that well but i think that was a problem with my text-to-speech system we were using there was a lot of spaces there that the text-to-speech didn't really recognize because there weren't any punctuation behind them but let's see i also have dark and bowel motions now Dark bowel movements can be a sign of internal bleeding, especially if they are accompanied by other symptoms such as abdominal pain, fatigue, dizziness, or lightheadedness. If you are experiencing any of these symptoms, it is important to seek medical attention as soon as possible. Your healthcare provider will be able to perform an examination and order any necessary tests to determine the cause of the dark bowel movements and provide an appropriate course of treatment. In the meantime, it is important to avoid taking any medications or supplements that could further irritate the digestive tract or cause internal bleeding. You should also drink plenty of fluids and eat a balanced diet to help support overall health and healing. If you are feeling overwhelmed or concerned about your symptoms, it is important to speak with your healthcare provider. They can provide you with the support and guidance you need to manage your symptoms and get back on the path to good health. Do you think I should stop playing golf? Whether or not you should stop playing golf depends on the cause of your pain and symptoms. If your pain is due to an injury or an underlying medical condition, it may be necessary to avoid activities that put strain on the affected area until it has fully healed. If you are experiencing pain and dark bowel movements, it is especially important to seek medical attention as soon as possible to determine the cause and receive appropriate treatment. Your healthcare provider will be able to provide specific recommendations based on your individual circumstances. They may suggest temporarily avoiding golf or other activities that put strain on the affected area, or they may recommend modifying your technique or using assistive devices to reduce strain. It is important to listen to your body and not push yourself too hard if you are experiencing pain or discomfort. Engaging in regular physical activity can be beneficial for your overall health and well-being but it is also important to prioritize your health and safety. If you have any concerns or questions about your symptoms or treatment options, it is important to speak with your healthcare provider. They can provide you with the guidance and support you need to manage your symptoms and maintain a healthy and active lifestyle. No, GPT, I think you misunderstood me. I meant, do you think I should stop playing golf to help my tennis elbow? If you have tennis elbow, it may be necessary to avoid activities that put strain on the affected area, such as playing golf or tennis, until it has fully healed. Tennis elbow is a condition that causes pain and inflammation in the outer part of the elbow, and it is typically caused by overuse or repetitive strain. To help manage tennis elbow, your healthcare provider may recommend rest, ice, and over-the-counter pain relievers, as well as physical therapy or other forms of rehabilitation. They may also suggest using a brace or strap to support the affected arm and reduce strain on the affected area. In some cases, your healthcare provider may recommend a cortisone injection or other forms of treatment to help manage pain and inflammation. It is important to follow your healthcare provider's recommendations and not push yourself too hard if you are experiencing pain or discomfort. Engaging in regular physical activity can be beneficial for your overall health and well-being but it is also important to prioritize your health and safety. If you have any concerns or questions about your treatment options, it is important to speak with your healthcare provider. They can provide you with the guidance and support you need to manage your symptoms and get back to your normal activities as soon as possible. Well, there you go. You can see ChatGPT becomes a bit repetitive after a while. Now, it's my pleasure now to introduce Associate Professor Josephine Thomas. Clinical Associate Lecturer at the Adelaide Medical School, Faculty of Health and Medical Sciences. She's also a specialist general physician, a clinical pharmacologist, and an educator. Jo's completed a PhD in medical education and has taught and coordinated a number of courses at the University of Adelaide. And she's a Director of Physician Education at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. I'm looking forward to hearing Jo's thoughts about this new technology. Welcome Associate Professor Jo Thomas. Well, thanks Jo. Thanks very much for coming on Aussie Med. It's great having you on board. Having heard the interview with ChatGPT, what were your initial thoughts and what were your opinions about how it responded to the simple questions about my lateral epicondylitis? Uh, Ninamani, Gavin, and thanks for inviting me. 
Look, I thought the interview with Chatbot was a good exercise and really interesting because with the rise of AI in medicine, I think we need to think critically about what it can do and how we use it. I was not so surprised at, at uh, what transpired. Uh, and as you said, it, it started to get really repetitive after a while. But I think what it does is gives us a great opportunity to consider some of the important aspects of communication in medical interactions. Yeah, it actually responded quite well. I set it up so it had voice-to-text input and there were some errors in the typing of the voice-to-text translation, which would have confused ChatGPT, but I left it on there to see if it actually could interpret what I was trying to say and it seemed to respond quite well to it. The monotonous voice got to me a little bit after a while and that was actually just the text of voice translation, which was relied on the on the Mac computer. And therefore, that became a bit monotonous after a while. But otherwise, I think the major issue I had was it didn't ask my age, gender, what medical problems I'd had in the past or any allergies, etc. And these could influence what the diagnosis was. Did you think that was a major concern? Absolutely. Look, to be fair, the chatbot told you repeatedly that it couldn't act as a medical tool, but you kept asking it for help. I thought you were a bit like a bad dinner party guest, Gavin. You're pestering someone for medical advice at a social function or something. (laughs) But despite that, I think... Um, it gave some really detailed answers. So there was a sense that it could act as a medical advisor. And I don't think um, someone who was a less discerning customer would have been able to to sort of tease that apart, particularly the way it delivered answers in some detail and with a really blunt style, almost emulated a confidence in providing advice, um, perhaps only at the level of um, a novice medical student, uh, but but nevertheless, it, it gave some confidence in that advice. And even after the warnings about it not being able to help you and you needing to see a practitioner, it continued to give quite detailed advice, sometimes running on at length with different therapies, including medications, referrals, physical therapies. So I thought it was um, almost a little bit dangerous. If it were to be used for diagnosis, obviously there'd have to be a significant validation and a much bigger library of diagnostic algorithms. I mean, pain in the outside of your elbow, you could have had a whole lot of red flags that just didn't come up um, in the way you asked the questions. Yeah, certainly. I chose lateral epicondylitis because it's the symptom I'm experiencing at the moment and I thought it was the best to actually ask as a patient. However, it is also one of the most common conditions in the elbow and therefore it has chosen perhaps the most common answer. They may have just purely chosen that because it's the most common answer at the elbow. Absolutely. Look, I think the diagnostic thing is only one part of it though, Gavin. And what I wanted to explore a little bit was the whole communication style. See, the medical interview is something that we've been doing for a long time now. Medicine's evolved quite a lot. And with medical education, it's a skill that we teach. We teach communication skills now. So if you think about how the chatbot approach things or how the the interview runs, that's where it really is different to a normal human transaction. And so it wasn't so much as a transactional thing as just simply you asking questions. Now, there were things that the chatbot did really well. And I think One of the things that you could do is use the exercise to point out to perhaps novice students about how we pick up and respond to verbal cues. For example, it was great at picking up on little things that you said, and it even acknowledged your distress when you went into that more psychological aspect of your injury. So I thought that was really good because when we're starting out in diagnostic reasoning and thinking, our interviews tend to be a little blunt and start to ignore those emotional aspects. So the chatbot actually responded quite well to any of those verbal cues. Obviously, there's things that it it can't do. and, And so it didn't really explore your feelings. It didn't explore lots of things. So it doesn't ask questions back. And I don't know if that's a possibility that that can be made to occur. One of the models, and there are lots of models that people use for teaching communication skills, but Calgary Cambridge is one of the common models that we think about when we look at a a structure of a medical interview. And, you know, there's a whole lot of components to it. And most of us as experienced practitioners end up developing our own style and our own flow to the way we do things. But the chatbot didn't have any of that. And that's why it ended up being repetitive. It didn't start with a nice intro, didn't try to build rapport we always have tricks to make people feel comfortable 
And as you say, it didn't sort of explore your gender, your age, some of the things that would be helpful in establishing the likelihood of certain conditions, but also they're really helpful in establishing those human connections. And so it didn't really get to build rapport with you. It just kept giving you lots and lots of advice. And that's where it comes up as, as being very robotic. But I think you can use that to really tease apart the aspects of a consultation that work well. I mean, we love to build that rapport with patients so that they will open up, tell us the sort of things we need so that we can perform that data mining ex expedition that, that really results in us getting a good history for a good diagnosis. And yeah, I, I just thought it, it was really obvious that it, it wasn't able to do that um, two-way communication piece with you. Thanks, Joe. They're great thoughts. And certainly you wonder whether a chatbot interview could be used as a teaching exercise to help students either learn the good and the bad techniques involved in interviewing. You also wonder whether an AI tool might be something that's be used in the future, like almost like a calculator is used by an engineer as a way of helping remember the different diagnoses and help assessing patients for the future but it certainly obviously needs a little bit more work yeah I don't know I mean maybe it's going to help us practice with things or maybe it's a good triaging tool I really like the work of Lauren Oakden Rayner here in Adelaide she's a radiologist and an AI researcher and she's given some really great talks on some of the limitations of AI and I think those are really important so one of the things I loved about your interview with the chatbot was it does give us that kind of opportunity to think critically about what it does and what the pitfalls are. And certainly we do need to make sure that we don't just run with AI. AI will sometimes see things that we're not seeing really well. And so we can probably learn from that. But at the same time, we need to continue to validate it in the right population, the population that we're seeing, uh, and ensure that the quality is there. So yeah, it could possibly be a triaging tool for some things. So it, it might triage your clinic one day, Gavin, and make sure that uh, you only get to see uh, tennis elbow, not golfer's elbow, or whatever it is you want. Excellent. Look, I really appreciate your time and effort in analysing this interview. And I'd like to emphasise once again for the listener that this is really just an experiment on assessing how well the chat GPT did work for medical diagnoses and communication style. But really, as the chat GPT regularly said, it's not to be used for medical diagnosis or assessment or treatment. And we're also not advocating for this to be used for such. Uh, any other final thoughts at all, Joe, on this whole process? Or do you think there's somewhere to go further for further research? Look, I think that it reinforces for me the really important human elements of the medical interview and the transactional nature of it. Because as you say, we have to know a lot as medical practitioners. But one of the things we've really learned over the years is our value as humans, as, as people that are able to build that relationship with our patients. And that is something that our patients value. And that's something I don't think the chatbot can get to grips with. It's sort of convenient, it sort of emulates some of those answers, but it doesn't really moderate its responses and it doesn't really learn to the extent that perhaps a, a good human in with good hu communication skills would in an interview. So I don't feel like it's about to replace me in the way I conduct a consultation just yet. Well, thank you very much. Associate Professor Joe Thomas, thank you very much for coming on board Aussie Med Ed. Thanks, Gavin. I'd like to thank you very much for listening to our podcast. I'd like to remind you that the information provided today is just for general medical advice and does not pertain to one particular medical condition or one way of treating a particular condition. If you have any concerns about information raised today, please do not hesitate to contact your general practitioner for further information. We hope you've enjoyed the podcast and please don't hesitate to give us a like or tell your friends about it or give us a positive review. We look forward to presenting another podcast to you in the near future on a different topic. Until then, stay safe. Thank you very much. Aussie Medit is proudly sponsored by HealthShare, a digital health company that provides solutions for patients, GPs and specialists across Australia, and Tego, offering medical indemnity insurance for doctors. That's tego.com.au.